the Drug Policy Alliance is a national nonprofit advocacy group, and uh, the shortest version of what we're doing is we're trying to end the war on drugs. We're trying to move our responses to drugs and people who use drugs out of the criminal justice system to the greatest extent possible and into the public health system um, for folks who need uh, health interventions um, and have developed problematic substance use um, or are otherwise at risk of other uh, health harms. Um, because of their drug use. And we want to see uh, our response to drugs uh, in this country. Um, we want to see it rooted in science, compassion, health, and human rights. Uh, and so um, our mission is to advance those policies and attitudes that best reduce the harms of both drug use and drug prohibition and to promote the sovereignty of individuals over their minds and bodies. Um, I've been working here in California for DPA for a little over 11 years, uh, and we do work in a number of different states as well as at the uh, federal level in DC. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about our kind of approach to drugs, and one of the things that makes us a little bit different from folks who come at this primarily looking at addiction uh, which is, you know, very certainly one of the most significant harms that can come from drug use. Um, but when we look at who uses drugs, the shortest answer to that is really all of us. Um, there's not a society that we know of where people haven't attempted to alter their consciousness in one way or another. Um, I certainly, you know, I'm dependent on my coffee that I have in the morning. Um, I really like whiskey. Uh, I think, you know, significant numbers of us use cannabis. Um, and even though small numbers of us may use, uh, you know, substances such as uh, heroin or crack, the reality is that many of us have had some sort of experience with a mind-altering substance somewhere along the way. And people do that for a whole variety of reasons. They may be spiritual, ceremonial, recreational. They may be addressing pain, addressing loneliness, addressing trauma. Um, people use drugs in a whole bunch of different contexts and for a whole bunch of different reasons. And only sometimes is that use problematic or harmful either to themselves or to others. And so when we think about sort of who uses drugs, we try to kind of back up a little bit from the focus of the addiction specialists. And I know you've gotten to hear, if you've been here for all of them, you've gotten to hear from some of my absolute favorite uh, medical doctors ever, um, Barry Zevin, uh, for example, um, Dan Ciccaroni, who every time he sp I hear him speak, I learn something new. So you've gotten to hear from some really great people, um, and I'm excited. But a lot of what they do by necessity is seeing only the folks who've developed problems related to their drug use. And so that's what they're focused on and what they're looking at. Um, so when we, we try to think a little bit more broadly about who uses drugs. And then also, you know, who develops problems related to drugs. So this first chart on the left, it's the percentage of people who used something last year uh, and aren't using it this year. So for example, um, you know, 76% of the people who tried crack the previous year weren't using it the subsequent year. We tend to have this sort of trope that people who use, you know, crack or methamphetamine or heroin, you use it once and you are instantly on a road to, you know, lying toothless in a gutter. And the vast, re the vast majority of people who ever try crack or ever try heroin um, for example, don't continue to use it, don't use it regularly. Um, and, uh, it, you know, it's, uh, um, you know, alcohol has the most, the highest frequency of reuse year over year, probably unsurprisingly. Crack um, inhalants and heroin and stimulants have the lowest rate, so people use them decide not for them, stop using it. And then the, the chart on the other side is the percentage of folks um, who were uh, tried it last year and then became dependent on it. 
uh, this year. And this is where we really see heroin and crack, for example. This is where the harms um, of those drugs do show up, right? So people um, who tried heroin last year, even though I just told you the majority, um, don't continue using it, don't develop dependence, which is true. But a higher proportion develop dependence to heroin uh, than do to um, you know, what's at the bottom, um, like tranquilizers, uh, alcohol, for example. So um, both not everyone develops problems, and there are some drugs that um, people are more likely to develop a dependence and a problem related to. So I'm going to take you uh, through a quick history of uh, drug prohibition in the United States. Um, you know, essentially all the drugs that are not legal now were legal at some point, and we made an intentional decision uh, as a, you know, nation of laws uh, to make these substances illegal. And the, the main takeaway that I want you to understand is that there was never a time when a group of experts, whether they were medical doctors or sociologists or even lawyers, um, sat down and said, which substances are the most harmful and let's make those illegal? And which ones are the least harmful and we're going to leave those as legal drugs? That has never happened and there is nothing about which drugs, which substances are legal and which are illegal that is based in any kind of scientific process. Um, so this is... Um, photo from a, um, a sort of tourist um, stereoscope photo from uh, what's called an opium den in San Francisco. And the very first laws passed criminalizing the use of a substance were passed here in San Francisco by our own Board of Supervisors in the 1870s. And ex what they did was explicitly they made the smoking of opium illegal. And this was done explicitly as an anti-Chinese effort. It was, a, it was an effort to um, control the Chinese population. They didn't make purchasing opium pills in a pharmacy illegal. You could still do that. They only made the smoking of opium illegal. And it was because this was perceived as, the, um, as a Chinese cultural practice. There was also a lot of very... Um, uh, racist tropes around white women um, consuming opium with Chinese men and, um, you know, again, these racist ideas about race mixing and the sort of need to protect the purity of white women. Um, and uh, it also happened in a time of, um, you know, the uh, Chinese men predominantly came over to the U.S. to help build the Transcontinental Railroad uh, and were you know, a huge part of why we were able to build that railroad. But once the railroad was done, they were seen as excess labor and people were worried that they were taking um, jobs, for example, and so there was a need to control them. Um, there are a number of other ways in the, which this showed up. Um, those of you know the history of Yik Wo and the laundry. Um, but um, for the part that I'm, I'm interested in is that they were focused on trying to control the Chinese population and do it by making um, one of their practices, cultural practices, illegal. And that ended up being the model for all of our subsequent laws of prohibition. So the laws against marijuana were targeting uh, Mexican workers in Texas, for example, um, uh, Mexican migrant workers. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you can read this, the headline, this is the New York Times. The headline says, Negro cocaine fiends are a new southern menace. There were all of these, and again, these are the same very racist tropes that we find in more modern coverage of it made them behave like animals, for example, and they were impervious to police bullets, and police needed stronger, bigger guns and stronger bullets. Um, so again, this is both like sort of basic American racism combined with um, uh, the association of a drug um, with a particular culture or race or ethnicity, and then uh, making that drug illegal as a system of racial control. Yes, um, uh, the audience is pointing out that this article was written by a medical doctor, and uh, yes, you know, the American medical profession has um, 
uh, you know, has a lot to answer for in terms of the ways in which it has upheld um, uh, racist ideas. Uh, I mean, and things like the Tuskegee syphilis study are one, but um, certainly, you know, that this was a, a medical doctor doesn't make the information in it actually accurate, sadly. Um, and so as we go on from uh, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, all being made illegal, um, and then the 60s and 70s, Nixon declared the war on drugs. And, um, it, it, you know, there's a, a somewhat um, apocryphal story about uh, Nixon and his uh, staffers saying like, well, you know, we've got to figure out a way to go after the um, the hippies and these radicals um, and black people. Um, I don't think he used that word. Um, and you know, what what can we do? Well, let's go after the drugs, and that way we'll be able to do this without saying who it is that we're actually going after. Um, so he declared officially the war on drugs in June 1971. Um, but at the same time, in 1972, they commissioned this report that uh, recommended that marijuana be decriminalized. It said marijuana is actually not that bad. Um, we shouldn't be criminalizing people for it. Uh, that didn't go anywhere at the federal level, but a number of states did start moving to relax their marijuana laws. Um, uh, but then um, the 80s and the 90s came in. Uh, this is when you know Nancy Reagan famously sort of pushed her "Just Say No" campaign, one of the most um, useless of all drug education initiatives ever. And it also was the beginning of crack cocaine um, in the United States and the impact that crack had on uh, low-income communities, particularly um, urban communities and particularly communities of color. And um, it was, you know, people were very legitimately concerned about what crack was doing, but what often goes um, unspoken in this is that this was also an era of um, great economic displacement where uh, industries and um, uh, capital were moving out of these urban areas um, and people were moving to the suburbs. Um, and uh, so crack wasn't necessarily the cause of the economic despair in these communities as much as sort of a symptom of it. But nonetheless, um, we uh, as a nation decided to vote to crack down on crack. And there was a lot of hysteria. There was a lot of concern about crack babies um, with all sorts of horrible and stigmatizing language. And um, at that point, uh, Congress decided that they were going to um, do something about this. And what they did was they put in place uh, significantly higher sentences for crack possession than we had for cocaine. Now, crack and cocaine are essentially the same thing. Um, yeah, crack is cocaine processed with baking soda. Um, and it, uh, it has a number of different impacts um, in terms of how you use it, how frequently you use it, how long the high lasts, but it's essentially the same thing chemically. And yet the sentences that we had for crack cocaine possession, the same amount of crack as cocaine, you would serve a 100 times longer sentence for that crack possession than you would for the cocaine possession. Um, and needless to say, this was implemented um, immediately in extremely racially disparate ways, um, where the vast majority of people who have uh, been arrested, charged, and convicted and are serving time for crack possession in this country um, are, are black and uh, Latinx people. Um, HIV also came along, which started to get some people to think a little bit differently about uh, some of these approaches, including um, talking about harm reduction as approach, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. Um, but this is what happened as a result of that um, desire uh, both to go after crack and to go after drugs generally. 
uh, you can see the the huge increase, um, particularly that middle blue uh, color is people in state prisons. You can see in the sort of mid to late 80s um, that really dramatic rise in the number of people incarcerated for drug viola drug law violations in the United States. And those numbers are only just now starting to come down um, from their peak. And there are a lot of other um, consequences of having, of being convicted of a drug offense, whether it's possession or sales. Uh, a lot of things are not accessible to people with a um, history of uh, drug conviction. Um, federal student loans, for example, much public housing, uh, often you can't even visit your family members in public housing um, for fear of them losing their housing. There's a lot of employment barriers, um, especially if you need to have any kind of license or certification, whether that's to be a barber or a beautician um, or a registered nurse. Uh, many, many licensing boards have permanent bars on people with a drug conviction, um, no matter if they haven't, uh, if they've they're in recovery, they've been treated, they haven't used a drug in you know, 20 years, uh, that doesn't matter. Um, food stamps, we only just got rid of this in California a few years ago. Uh, people with a drug conviction, and only people with a drug conviction, were uh, had a lifetime bar on receiving food stamps um, in this state. Uh, child custody, certainly the right to vote, um, is uh, you know taken away or delayed. Uh, gun ownership. The one thing that is not a collateral consequence of a drug offense conviction is any guaranteed entry into drug treatment or any guarantee that your health issues uh, will be taken care of. Certainly, some people do get treatment uh, while incarcerated, but that's a tiny, tiny percent of the people who are incarcerated for drugs. Um, and in particular, uh, it, you know, one of the biggest impacts is the impact that this has had on communities of color. Uh, the racial disparities around who is arrested, charged, incarcerated, who ends up with these um, charges on their record uh, for life. Two thirds of the people incarcerated for a drug offense in state prison are black or Latinx. Um, although we also know that people of color use drugs uh, at approximately the same uh, percent as white people do. Um, so this isn't a reflection of increased use. Um, it's a, a reflection of over-policing of communities and um, the, the ways in which these laws are um, implemented in very racially disparate ways. And I already talked a little bit about the crack and powder cocaine sentencing. Um, I, I'm, you know, it, it's worth saying that these racial disparities hold true here in San Francisco as well, um, where, for example, African Americans make up uh, somewhere around 5% of the total population of San Francisco, but they're well over 50% of the people in our county jail tonight are African American. Um, and studies have also research by the Center for Juvenile and Criminal Justice also found that young black women were most likely uh, to be arrested um, for drug charges here in San Francisco, even though, again, they're a tiny, tiny uh, proportion of the population. Um, so what do we do about all of that? <laughs> so that's, uh, you know, that's the, the work that um, sort of the history that the Drug Policy Alliance and our allies and different organizations are trying to undo um, and uh, repair uh, the harms that have been caused by this. Um, so, you know, these are the, the main areas where the Drug Policy Alliance works. I'm going to focus on the harm reduction, public health, and overdose aspects of it, because I know that's what this uh, series is focused on. But just to give you a, a quick overview of the kinds of work that we do, um, uh, certainly legalizing marijuana, uh, first medical use, uh, and then more recently adult use. And our main area of focus within this is focusing on the racial justice and racial equity and uh, ensuring that the, um, as best we can, that the profits from marijuana legalization are used to repair the harms that have been done, particularly to communities of color, um, by marijuana prohibition and by drug prohibition. 
Um, we were we played a big role in uh, Prop 64 here in California, both drafting it and, and working on the campaign to pass it. And then our role in implementation has been trying to um, uphold the racial equity components of it, uh, which is challenging work, but um, but worth doing. We do a huge amount around criminal justice reform, so sentencing, trying to reduce sentences for drug possession and drug sales, undoing asset forfeiture, uh, where police departments can take um, your property, uh, your house, your car, your money, um, just on the uh, charge, not on a conviction, but just they can charge you and arrest you and take your belongings. Um, it's one of the most sort of starkly wrong and to my non-lawyer mind unconstitutional uh, things that we do in the name of the war on drugs, um, but it, it still happens. And then, you know, our ultimate goal is decriminalizing drug use, um, probably not surprisingly. Um, that's part of getting it out of the criminal justice system, uh, is decriminalizing it and making it no longer a criminal offense um, to be in possession of uh, personal amounts of drugs. And then the work around harm reduction and public health, and this is really where I'm focused in the work that I've done here in California and San Francisco, one is around sterile syringe access, so needle exchange syringe access programs, extremely effective at disrupting HIV and Hep C transmission, uh, connecting people to services, um, and uh, yeah, one of the most effective HIV interventions that we have. Um, naloxone, which you've probably heard about in previous uh, sessions, um, and trying to do everything we can to expand access to naloxone. Uh, here in California, we worked on some um, prescriber liability protections. Uh, we worked to give pharmacists the ability to dispense naloxone from a pharmacy without needing a prescription. We've worked to get additional funds in the state budget um, to pay for naloxone for community distribution. Uh, we work to expand access to treatment, um, especially medication-assisted treatment. So that's the buprenorphine uh, that you heard about from um, Dr. Zevin, uh, as well as methadone. Um, and ultimately, we're also interested in uh, heroin-assisted treatment, which has shown fantastic results in Canada and Europe um, for keeping people in treatment uh, and improving their health outcomes. Um, and then supervised consumption services, which I'm now about to spend a whole lot of time talking about because that is the campaign that I've been working on the most. Um, this is the work that I do, and uh, it's the work that I do here in San Francisco uh, and at the state level. And so supervised consumption services are places where people who use drugs uh, show up with their pre-obtained substances and they're able to use them in a safe, clean, sterile environment, welcoming environment, with uh, staff there who are trained in uh, recognizing and reversing overdoses. Um, they usually have a mix of clinical and peer staff, so you may have some nurses, uh, licensed clinical social workers, and also some peers who, um, uh, you know, sort of come from the same. Um, perspective, maybe current or former drug users themselves. And uh, so then what people do is they will go ahead and use their drugs, and they're provided with all the sterile equipment that they need, syringes, cookers, ties, alcohol prep pads, so on. We'll use those drugs. Um, they have an opportunity to ask questions, um, and the staff there have an opportunity to engage folks in conversation after they've used their drugs. They stay uh, for a little bit longer for observation uh, so that um, if there is an overdose or any other uh, unwanted side effect, um, staff can intervene. And what they do, uh, as it turns out, is serve as a really fantastic way to engage with people and help connect them to other services that they need, including drug treatment. Um, Supervised consumption services, they've been around for a long time. The first one opened in Switzerland in 1986. Um, it's hard to keep track of how many there are because they keep opening, um, uh, but we, there's around 150 uh, currently in 12 countries, although Ireland is on the verge of opening them. Finland is on the verge of opening one. Um, 
And uh, here we talk a lot about insight in Vancouver, both because Vancouver is fairly similar to San Francisco in a lot of ways, and also because the, the first program in Vancouver was very heavily researched and continues to be heavily researched. So we've got a fantastic evidence base uh, to use when we talk about what these programs are and what they do. Um, there aren't any authorized programs in the United States. We're trying to change that. There is one underground program somewhere in the United States uh, that's been described in the research literature, um, but we don't yet have any authorized programs. Um, so this is a photo of Insight in Vancouver. It sometimes gets uh, compared to a hair salon with the um, stainless steel tables and the overhead lighting and the mirrors. Um, but this is what it looks like. Uh, this is the injection room itself. There's also the entrance welcome area, and then there's the sort of chill out lounge where people go after they've um, consumed their drugs. And so, as I said, we've got a lot of research findings. Um, one is that the programs, um, the program at Insight, resulted in, uh, and this is one of the things that people are often very interested in in San Francisco, reductions in public disorder related to injection drug use, um, reductions in public uh, injection, public drug use, uh, discarded syringes. Um, and uh, one of the other key points is that people who use this program in Vancouver are more likely to go into detox more likely to go into treatment and more likely to stop using drugs than other people who use drugs in Vancouver who don't go to Insight. Um, and in fact, um, uh, the use of detox increased by over 30% after Insight opened, and um, about a third of the folks who go into Insight uh, go into detox in any given year. Um, there are overdoses at Insight. Uh, they have multiple overdoses every day at this point. There have been overdoses at all of these facilities around the world, but there's never been a known death uh, from overdose. And when you compare that to the 70,000 people in the United States who died of an overdose last year, uh, it sort of calls the question on why we aren't um, trying these programs here. Um, you know, in terms of HIV and hepatitis C, uh, they, these are very effective at disrupting transmission, uh, which happens primarily when people share equipment, share injecting equipment. Um, they attract a population of folks who are at high risk for HIV and hep C. Um, and the folks who use this uh, reduce their risk both while they're there at Insight and also if they're injecting elsewhere, um, they continue to uh, maintain that um, risk reduction. And one of the other findings is that these programs have not um, very research language prompted adverse changes. Basically, they haven't increased drug use. They haven't drawn people to start using drugs because these programs exist, um, and they haven't led to any increases in drug-related crime. Uh, in fact, uh, and this is a finding from the Australian uh, one in Sydney, they found that sort of property crimes like, you know, car windows being broken and minor things being stolen um, went down uh, in the area around the program after it opened. Um, and again, this is, this is a photo from Insight. This is the type of uh, supplies that they give you with the syringe and cooker and, um, and prep pad. And so this, I'm just going to zip through these, but this is uh, research from when Insight opened. So as the use of it went up and, you know, hundreds of people who inject drugs started going every day, um, public injection drug use dropped pretty dramatically. And similarly, um, injection-related litter, so improperly disposed of syringes, also dropped off. Um, and they've seen continuations of those findings there. Uh, this is certainly one of the things that people are very interested in San Francisco. Um, if you spend much time downtown, the Civic Center, Tenderloin area, uh, you've probably seen syringes on the ground. You've probably seen people um, using drugs in public. And certainly those individuals really don't want to be using drugs in public. Um, it's really a last resort, uh, just as with so many of our unhoused neighbors don't want to be um, 
living in public and living their life in public, uh, and they certainly don't want to be using drugs in public either. Um, and they very much want an alternative, uh, which I think we can all agree, we want them to have an alternative uh, to injecting drugs in public. Um, this is, you know, just these programs are very cost effective, and I'll get into a little more detail about what that means here in San Francisco. Um, so we've been working on this in San Francisco since 2007. We held a day-long symposium back in 2007. Uh, co-sponsored with the health department, and we got some political backlash from that, um, from right-wing radio and conservative senators and so on, and it sort of um, put a damper on the conversation around this. But over the last, uh, I'd say, five or six years, the conversations really picked back up, partly, again, because people are concerned about public drug use. Um, and syringe litter, as well as um, concerns about overdose, and as overdose deaths go up um, around the country, including here, uh, there's increasing call for it. Um, so this is some of the research here in San Francisco, uh, research from way back in 2010, found that people who inject drugs um, will, 85% um, of people who inject drugs said they would use it, um, but they're not going to travel very far for it, so it needs to be located somewhere convenient for them. And we did an informal survey. This was a, an intern with me who surveyed uh, businesses in the Tenderloin, and um, unsurprisingly, business owners in the Tenderloin and, and uh, employees, um, the vast majority of them had seen people injecting in public and thought it was a problem for their business. Public drug use was a problem for their business. And, um, and then again, once the concept was explained to them, they thought this was a good idea and would help address some of the problems that they were facing. This is the cost-benefit analysis that said basically if we took something like Insight in Vancouver and brought it to San Francisco um, with the same sort of cost that Insight costs in Vancouver, what would the impact be? And it found that we would um, avert HIV cases, uh, prevent hepatitis C cases, um, as well as being able to connect people with treatment. And found every dollar spent would generate $2.33 in savings. And overall found that it would save San Francisco millions of dollars if we opened one. Um, and sometimes I get asked sort of like, why is syringe exchange not enough? Like why isn't that sufficient to sort of prevent all of these health harms? And one reason is that uh, hepatitis C, viral hepatitis, is more easily transmissible. You don't actually have to share syringes to transmit hep C. It can be done through sharing some of the injection equipment. Um, you know, a lot of the folks who work in these programs already talk about safer injecting practices uh, and distribute sterile supplies, but that's not sufficient. Um, we call it accidental supervised consumption service. Um, a lot of times the bathrooms in uh, social service programs or the, you know, background, the bathroom in a McDonald's, for example, we know that people will use whatever seems slightly safer for them um, to inject, but that's really not actually much safer. Um, it may be more private, um, but privacy can also bring a risk of, of not being found if you overdose. Um, and, um, and then the syringe disposal issues as well. Um, as this conversation around supervised consumption services has sort of taken off uh, at the national level, a number of different medical associations have weighed in. Uh, the San Francisco Marin Medical Society was one of the first um, to publish a statement saying that they thought this was a good idea, that they had reviewed the medical evidence. Then the Massachusetts Medical Society uh, did a full report, looked at all the evidence, and said they thought this was a good idea. And based in large part on the, on the Massachusetts Medical Society, the American Medical Association uh, said that they thought that um, we should open pilot facilities and research them um, and see if they work here. Um, and so this is some of the work that, that I'm doing, and this is the sort of California policy um, work, is trying to pass legislation here in California to make these programs, um, to provide some legal protections for these programs. 
Um, certainly, uh, illicit, the use of illicit substances remains illegal under federal law. Um, obviously, that covers marijuana as well. Um, we're not at this point trying to change federal law, although certainly that's the ultimate goal. But what we are trying to do is change state law to provide some protections for the people who use these programs, operate them, um, city officials who are, are part of the process of putting them together. Um, and so we've been working on this for a number of years. Uh, the author of this legislation is uh, Assemblymember Susan Talamantes Eggman. She's from Stockton, um, and she is uh, she has a PhD in social work. Um, part of my deep love for social workers. Um, and uh, used to work in a substance use treatment program. And when we took this idea to her, she grabbed it and ran with it and has been a fantastic champion. We now, for the current bill, State Senator Scott Weiner and Assemblymember David Chu from here are also both co-authoring. So the first year we tried to do this bill, we couldn't even get a vote on it in the very first committee. It was too radioactive and they all said, nope, we're not even gonna, not even gonna think about taking a look at this or asking people to vote on it. Then um, it took us uh, two years to get the bill through the Assembly and the Senate, got it to the governor's desk last fall, and he vetoed it, uh, based pretty heavily on his misunderstanding of substance use and problematic substance use. Um, but he vetoed it, even though we got it all the way to him. And so we started over again this year, and this bill is currently in the Assembly, uh, made it through the Assembly Health and Public Safety Committees, and should get voted on um, possibly as early as tomorrow. Uh, and then it'll start over on the Senate side. Obviously, we have a different governor, um, one who you know is more familiar and supportive of San Francisco and San Francisco's elected officials, uh, having been mayor here. Um, and he's also been both very critical of the go previous governor's veto um, and very interested in this idea. So we think we're in a very different place uh, around that. And we're co-sponsoring, Drug Policy Alliance is co-sponsoring this with a coalition of substance use treatment programs, harm reduction programs, HIV and hepatitis C programs, um, including the California Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, some of the biggest treatment providers, um, Harm Reduction Coalition. CADP is the California Association of Alcohol and Drug Program Executives, uh, which was way too long to fit on the slide. Um, and uh, just yesterday, um, in very exciting news, the Oakland City Council uh, voted unanimously uh, to endorse the bill and ask that they be added. The current legislation only covers uh, San Francisco, um, but Oakland has said that they're really interested in this, uh, led by their mayor, and they want to be added to it. Um, and you know, we get we get pushback primarily from law enforcement on this. Um, they, they don't really, you know, the, the evidence and the research on these programs is very one-sided, um, but law enforcement likes the status quo, uh, and so they've been the, the main opposition around this legislation. Um, and so that's sort of the, it, and we've also worked here locally uh, to build up support uh, such that, uh, you know, Mayor Breed, um, has really taken this on as an issue. The first elected officials who really jumped on this were uh, Supervisor David Campos. Um, when he was on the Board of Supervisors, he got very interested in this and tried to push it through legislation. Um, but at this point, we've got support from all sides of the, the San Francisco political spectrum um, on this uh, for different reasons sometimes, but um, there's very widespread support. The Chamber of Commerce, SF Travel, uh, have come on board and are supporting this, as well as the district attorney and the sheriff. Um, and certainly, I know a lot of people are supporting this because, because their primary concern is public injection. They don't want visitors, people um, going to businesses downtown to see people injecting in public. Um, other folks are primarily worried about overdose deaths and keeping people alive or the cost to the city. Um, but, you know, from my perspective, the, the, you know, people who use drugs deserve to be treated with compassion and dignity, and this is the best way uh, that we're going to be able to um, provide them without respect and dignity. Um, so um, one sort of final comment about where 
where we think all of this needs to go, um, and I mentioned that we're, you know, we support decriminalizing drugs and moving drugs out of the criminal justice system, and we've got one good model for this, uh, which is the country of Portugal. How many folks have heard anything about Portugal and drugs? So Portugal, um, uh, a number of years ago, um, decided to, they, I mean, they had a number of different motivations for it, but one was that they have a sort of a cultural model that wants people to be included. Um, social inclusion is something that they value, um, and social exclusion uh, was a concern, and they realized that people who use drugs were not um, being included, and they looked at why and sort of you know, thought about the stigma and the criminalization that people were experiencing and decided to try decriminalizing drugs instead as a way to better include everyone in society and also to address some really pretty significant health problems. Um, HIV rates uh, had skyrocketed in Portugal. Um, overdose deaths as well. So they sort of simultaneously decriminalized possession for personal use and dramatically scaled up their treatment capacity, especially for opioid dependence. Um, and they have these, they call them dissuasion commissions. If people come to the attention of the police because of their drug use, they go in front of these commissions that have um, health professionals, social workers, and so on, and they try to work with the individual and come up with what would, um, what would meet their needs. Do they need to be in treatment? Um, do they need housing? What's going on with them? Um, with certainly the goal of dissuading people from using drugs, but not through using uh, criminal penalties. And so, um, you know, the results have been pretty dramatic in terms of uh, fewer overdose deaths, uh, lower HIV rates, um, and somewhat sort of surprisingly and maybe kind of counterintuitive, reduced drug use, um, particularly among young people. And this was one of the areas that a lot of people were very concerned. Uh, if you make, you know, and, and I think it's a reasonable concern, you know, people think about it in terms of marijuana. If we make marijuana legal, isn't youth use just going to go up? Um, if we decriminalize drugs, aren't young people going to use drugs more? Um, you know, I may come across as pretty pro, pro drug here, but um, you know, certainly the reality is that while uh, young people's brains are developing up until about the age of 24, drugs do a lot more harm um, than they do for older people whose uh, brains are more fully formed. And I think that uh, dissuading young people from using drugs and certainly from using drugs in problematic ways is probably one of the most um, essential uh, things that we need to be doing a better job of in terms of how we mitigate the harms related to drugs is providing our young people with better drug education. Um, but uh, that uh, um, aside, uh, what happened in Portugal was that um, drug use among young people decreased. And certainly, um, they really dramatically increased the number of people in treatment. Um, so that's sort of the model that, that we would like to move towards as a policy goal. How do we uh, expand treatment um, substantially enough that um, anyone who needs treatment at any point is able to get it um, and get effective treatment, get quality treatment that's culturally competent, uh, that's affordable, um, that's effective, certainly. Um, and that's one of the big challenges, as you probably heard from, from uh, some of your previous speakers. Only a small percent of folks who have opioid use disorder um, or who are dependent on opioids in problematic ways actually have access to treatment. And, um, you know, especially when we've got medications as effective as buprenorphine and methadone uh, that are really, you know, methadone really is the gold standard for opioid use disorder. It's extremely uh, well researched and among other things it, um, you know, drops people's risk of overdose uh, death um, by about 50 percent. And, uh, you know, there's no, um, you know, there's no, there's no medical reason why everyone with a diagnosed opiate use disorder isn't 
um, being offered at least methadone or buprenorphine. Um, the reason that they're not is either because of uh, stigma or misperceptions about those treatments, um, which again, you probably heard from, from previous speakers, um, uh, or they're not just not accessible to people. It's still, it, you know, there are states that don't have uh, methadone on their Medicaid formularies, uh, Medicaid being um, treatment for low income, uh, health insurance for low income people. Um, but if you're low income in those states, uh, you're not gonna have any access to methadone or buprenorphine unless you pay for it yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of state of treatment in this country um, continues to um, sort of in a, in a variety of different settings. Uh, in correctional settings is one of the most significant gaps where um, the, the vast majority of correctional facilities, even if you were uh, stable on methadone um, under the care of a doctor or had a buprenorphine prescription for years, if you go into um, any of the California state facilities, for example, they will taper you off of it very quickly um, because you're not allowed to be on it even if uh, your, you and your doctor agreed that it was uh, keeping you healthy and keeping you stable. Again, there's no medical or clinical reason for people to be taken off of it. It's just a matter of, of um, control or even punishment. Uh, so that's one of the things that um, just this year, in fact, the California um, receiver who oversees health care in the California state prisons is trying to work to expand Medicaid uh, assisted treatment, methadone and buprenorphine, um, and naltrexone in the state prison system. Apparently the California prison system has the highest overdose death rate of any state prison system, um, so they are uh, finally feeling called to do something about that. Um, but again, the, the state of treatment um, it's, you know, it's one of these things that people say like, well, you know, we're going to have to force people into treatment. Um, you know, no one wants to go into treatment. We have to force people into treatment. This issue around conservatorships and uh, mandated treatment, um, uh, you know, mandating that people uh, get on treatment if they want to stay out of jail, things like that all of which is really missing the point that there are huge numbers of people who desperately want to get into treatment and face um, huge barriers, uh, wait lists, um, inaccessibility, lack of affordability. Uh, there's still counties in California that don't have a methadone provider, for example. So if you were to try to get on methadone, you'd probably have to drive several hours every day uh, to access a methadone clinic. Um, those are also, unsurprisingly, some of the counties that have the highest overdose rates, overdose death rates um, in the state. So fortunately, again, the state is trying uh, at the moment to really expand uh, treatment, especially in rural counties, including on the, the rancherias and the Indian Health Service areas. Um, and using this, taking the model from Vermont, which is called this um, hub and spoke model, and using it to expand uh, treatment in rural counties that didn't have any. Um, but it's still, uh, you know, one of the most significant policy challenges is just that there's not enough treatment out there for opioid use disorder. Um, and it's, it's one of the areas that we need to sort of push the hardest to get, and certainly while there isn't enough treatment, we need to use harm reduction approaches to keep people alive. So that's where naloxone and supervised consumption services and things like that come into play. Uh, how do we keep people alive until they're able to get into treatment um, or uh, until they change their relationship with drugs and it's no longer causing them the problem that they used to? Um, so that's sort of the, the end of my um, comments. I'm happy to answer questions about uh, either uh, other things that we're working on, the Drug Policy Alliance, um, uh, anything about supervised consumption services, conservatorships, uh, any of the drug-related policy issues. Um, and I'm happy to be sort of closing out this series with the policy focus. I, I um, have deep respect for the, um, the MDs that, that spoke here, and some of them are also very engaged in the policy um, approach. Um, Barry Zeva and Phil Coffin and Dan Ciccaroni in particular are all always uh, happy to you know come up to Sacramento or testify in front of Congress, things like that. 
um, which is great, but the, the sort of the medical research um, and epidemiological research alone isn't going to change uh, people's lives and keep them alive longer if we don't figure out how to turn that research um, into action and get it in front of policymakers so that they're making decisions based on the best evidence, the best clinical practice, um, the experiences of, of doctors like um, like Dr. Zevin. Uh, so um, all of that, all of the, the clinical knowledge and the research is, is essential and needed, um, but if we don't have the policy work to really put it into effect and use it to change um, practices, it, it won't go as far as it could. So I will end there, and I'm happy to take any questions or have more conversation about any of these topics. Yeah, so the question is about what are the chances of um, having something where uh, people's uh, drug of choice is provided to them instead of them having to purchase it in the illicit market, purchase something on the street. And that's where um, uh, heroin-assisted treatment is actually really interesting and is happening, uh, not in the US, um, but in a number of countries in Europe and in Canada as well. And it's proven extremely effective at keeping people um, in treatment, at stabilizing them, um, a lot of people, I'm most familiar with the research in Canada, but people, you know, are like, if I don't have to go out and A, find the money, and then B, find the drug every day, I'm able to really think about all these other things in my life and reunite with my family or go back to school or get a job. Um, and not everyone who uh, started out on, uh, hero on pharmaceutical grade heroin, diacetyl morphine, um, stayed on it. Some people transitioned to methadone, for example, uh, somewhat surprising the researchers. But um, methadone you do once a day, the diacetyl morphine, the heroin, they were doing three times a day just based on how long it lasts in your body. And people wanted something that was less sort of intrusive in their life than going into a clinic three times a day. And once a day was something that they could manage. So. Um, uh, I certainly am hopeful, you know, the, the, um, much of the harms and the risks related to drugs are from purchasing an unregulated product in the black market that may be contaminated with fentanyl, certainly um, is what we're seeing uh, across the U.S. and Canada and now increasingly um, in San Francisco as well. Um, you just, you have no idea what you're purchasing when you're buying something on the black market. And um, so folks are trying to use different drug checking technologies to assess what's in their substances. But um, I agree the best option would be a regulated market and whether it's a, a medicalized market, so people are getting a prescription for something or coming in daily um, to do it, or certainly there are other uh, illicit substances that, um, you know, I mean, there's some that are showing a huge amount of um, medical promise, like psilocybin mushrooms and MDMA and LSD even. Um, but I, I agree that's the direction we need to go, and it would help um, mitigate a lot of the, the harms that um, people experience because of drugs. I don't know how long it's going to take. Obviously, our federal laws, even though we've you know legalized marijuana here and in a number of other states, federal law continues to criminalize it. Um, you know, Ultimately, federal law is going to have to change, I think, before any of those things happen. And I, you know, given the current state of the federal government, I'm pessimistic about many things <laughs> these days. But um, uh, I certainly hope that, that we get there. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the question is about, do I see a change in societal attitudes towards drug use and, and um, uh, people who use drugs, and has there been overall a trend towards a more medical or health approach versus a criminal approach? And I think absolutely yes. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I, that I actually like about this job is it's, um, being able to see the changes um, in how people talk about drugs, how people talk about their own and disclose their own drug use, um, and the ways in which, uh, you know, sort of if you look at 
polling that we've done, that other people have done, there's generally very broad, strong agreement that the war on drugs has been a failure. Um, and that's reassuring uh, because it used to be that, you know, this kind of um, lock them up and throw away the key approach to drug use was, was the predominant one. And I do think that that has substantially shifted uh, in the U.S. and, um, you know, seeing things like, you know, like legalizing adult use of, of cannabis um, is an example of people really shifting from uh, this is criminal behavior, this is bad um, and should be punished to maybe this is okay uh, for adults to do. Um, I think that's one example. I think that in general there has been more uh, acceptance of um, of treatment, of being in recovery. There's less stigma. Um, there's still a lot of stigma around being in recovery, um, and even more so about using drugs, but there's less stigma than there used to be. I also think that, you know, one of the things that has happened around opioid use in the U.S. over the last few years is there's been this perception that opioids are predominantly being used by um, by white people, often by low to middle income white people. Um, and, uh, you know, and that has, um, to a lot of criticism, um, also, you know, led like the people to talk about this sort of whiter face of drug use. Um, and that's led a lot of sort of family members to, uh, who have a fair amount of social capital um, to be a part of really pushing to change and promote treatment first options instead of criminal justice options. Um, that's a little frustrating because, you know, people of color use opioids too and have, and certainly, uh, you know, heroin use, um, as you know, heroin's never gone away in this country, but um, African American communities in particular have really been. Um, forced to deal with uh, the impacts of heroin use. And so it's, you know, this perception that it's this new white epidemic and the sort of amount of kind of social capital that goes along with it and um, sort of pressure to, to have a more health-based approach. Uh, you know, certainly I welcome the health-based approach, but I kind of am dubious about, you know, how far we're going to get if we continue to sort of racialize this, um, this divide in this way. It needs to be a health-based approach for everyone. Um, and so hopefully we're going to be able to keep it going in that way. The more recent numbers showing that overdose deaths have been going up among people of color um, makes me worry that we won't be able to hold on to some of that. Uh, sort of push for more treatment and health-oriented approach. Um, uh, but yeah, I very definitely think it's changed, and it's changed in the, in the right way. Um, I've appreciated, you know, people coming out about their own uh, histories of drug use, um, uh, either, you know, identifying as being in recovery now or their histories of non-problematic drug use, of, you know, yeah, I did that in college and I'm fine now, or um, whatever it is. Um, and I think all of that move, are good moves towards destigmatizing drug use, uh, which I think is necessary to get people to a place where if they are having a problem, they're able to say they need help. Um, or if they're not having a problem, then not. <laughs> um, but uh, but at least being open about it and understanding what the risks are and being able to to um, mitigate any risks related to their use. All right. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I love talking about this. <laughs> thank you.